Hi, my name is Mihai Malaimara Jr. and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben Rock. How are you doing? Hey, Ilya. I'm doing super well. How are you? Uh, pretty good. It's another fantastic episode of the Cinematography Podcast. And, Always uh, a good day. Who, who's on our show today? He is a returning champion, Mihai Malimari, who uh, we had on for Jojo Rabbit. And I had interviewed him in kind of a press junket thing, but they, we were the last one of the day. So he gave me a little extra time. That was like, that's ancient history. That was like uh, pre-pandemic. That was like two and a half years ago. So you interviewed him for The Harder They Fall. Nice. But before we get into the interview, hey, uh, we got to give a quick shout out to our friends at Assemble.tv, the makers of this incredible software that is a performance production software that allows you to take control over all the stuff that used to be very disparate and different in different places and hard to track and puts it all into one thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a virtual interactive production binder that you build in real time. And you can share assets with anyone who needs to see them and they don't need to have a, an account to see video or audio or whatever. And, and, and you can get comments and notes. It has, I think, the coolest calendar I've ever seen in my life. It's also super affordable and it's even more affordable when you sign up and use the promotional code Cinepod, C-I-N-E-P-O-D. Uh, do that and you get a month on us. Yeah, definitely do it. Check it out if you've got a production coming up. Hey, let's say you have a production that's even going to be less than a month. Give it a shot. You could do your whole production in this. I've worked on plenty of productions that were like started and wrapped in under a month. So uh, I don't think in your wildest imagination you would do it differently once you've tried Assemble.tv. Give it a shot. And hey, Ben, we've also got a book giveaway going on on Instagram. If you go to at the Cinepod, you will see the book giveaway. Follow the instructions, which I think is really minimal. It's called Directing Great Television by Dan Adias, a guest on the show, Dan Adias. And it is an amazing book. I have read it and we will give you a signed copy of it from Dan Adias. If you've ever been interested in what it's like uh, to direct television win, or even if you win, not everyone's going to get that. That's true. One winner will be chosen at random. And uh, they will get a signed copy. And if you've ever wondered what it's like to direct television, if you've ever thought about directing television yourself, this book is invaluable. This guy has directed some of the most amazing television over the last, whatever, 30 something years. And also he directed Stephen King's Silver Bullet werewolf movie. Holy crap. <laughs> and I know how much you love werewolves. Oh so, man, I can't uh, get so enough of those it. werewolves. <laughs> All right. So Ben, let's get into the close focus for today. A little bit's been going on in the industry, at least regarding just a tiny, <laughs> just, just a smidge, <laughs> regarding IATSE, the International yeah. Association of Theatrical Stage Employees. They uh, they had a a vote for their entire membership in the U.S., and uh, there was a, a a real contention over the contract. And it turns out, uh, several of the the locals voted it down, voted no, but enough of them voted yes that it ratifies. It but was it was like an electoral college kind of thing where like 51% of the membership voted against it. But because it wasn't like a straight vote, it was more like you're voting and then your local has to go in and be sort of your delegate. So even though the majority of IATSE, a thin majority of IATSE had voted against it, it still went through. Yeah, that, that's accurate. And locals uh, for the camera department, 600, grip, 80, electric, 728, and costume all voted no against it. And I know camera is the largest, but yeah, there were several others that voted for it. And so it carries and it looks like there's probably not going to be a, another negotiation uh, on any, <sighs> any of this until 2024. So the next three years, uh, hours, a lot of aspects of working conditions are not going to be addressed. There's going to be some very, very unhappy campers out there. I don't mean to be political about this, but can't we just have an election where people vote on something and uh, no one's like, you know, there's always going to be winners and losers, but it doesn't have to be such a razor thin margin every time for every vote. Oh, my God. Yeah, it, it's interesting, though, because on a couple of the locals, it was overwhelmingly no 
Yeah. And on the ones that were yes, with the exception of 706, which I don't know what that is off the top of my head, that's the only one that was really solidly in the win column mm-hmm. uh, and the yes column. All the others are pretty close or really no. Like Local 80 was 30% yes, 70% no. That's pretty overwhelming. So That is pretty insane. Yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess the good news is we get to keep working. Yes. That is the good news. The bad news is that we didn't get satisfactory uh, hours and stuff uh, negotiated to, I would say, a humane standard. I'm even a little bit more surprised in the wake of the safety stuff on the set of the movie Rust that that didn't sway people more. Or maybe it did and it just didn't sway them far enough. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised too, especially, well, granted, I mostly socialize with the 600 folk, but some 80 mm. folk and some other, other things. But in all the people I'm talking to, it was really overwhelmingly no, really, really no. Mm. I'm like, like in a 10 to 1 scale of no. But yeah, it's not, it wasn't like that everywhere. I mean, to me, way, that was even, that even qualifies as a nope vote. Like, yeah, as a nope, for sure. Solid nope. Yeah. A nuh uh. Yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, hey, we'll see what happens in 2024. We'll see if the union leadership maintains uh, their same position, and we'll see if uh, people complain more uh, about all the stuff they were complaining about this time around, or uh, how many people uh, get fed up and no longer do this sort of work. That that could happen as well. So. Yeah, I just hate to say it. It just feels like stuff doesn't get <laughs> fixed, and I feel like unions get demonized. Not to go too off topic, but last week tonight on John Oliver, literally last night, he did a whole thing about union busting. Yeah, and I couldn't help but think about our industry through the lens of what he was describing. And you know, he's talking about people at Amazon or Target or whatever who've tried unsuccessfully to unionize over the years, and all the tactics that kind of come down on the unions as they try and do what's right for their members. So here we have an industry that is already unionized and somehow it doesn't have the will to push hard enough to get what they want out of uh, out of the AMPTP. And, and, you know, I'm in a union, I'm in the Directors Guild that I think is actually pretty good at getting what they want out of the AMPTP, partly because the AMPTP seems to think that the only position that is just, you just can't get rid of is director and assistant director and all the people, you know, like you, you really can't make a movie without that team of people. It's not just the director, but the DGAs never had to go on strike as a result. You know, and I think if the DGA threatened strikes, I I just I've always been of the belief that there should be just one union for the entire entertainment industry because you have the Writers Guild and the Screen Actors Guild and the Directors Guild and IATSE and Teamsters. All of those people negotiating separately sort of means that the AMPTP is able to kind of pit one against the other. Divide and conquer. Definitely divide and conquer and pit one against the other. They sign a deal with the Directors Guild and then they expect the Writers Guild to go along with that deal, even though the Writers Guild had no part negotiating it, which is just not in the nature of of human beings to be okay about that. They do that kind of stuff all the time. And I feel like the uh, IATSE people, weirdly, it's just straight up friggin' Marxism. These people, they are the blood of the industry. No movie gets made without camera people and art department people and editors. Like these are the people who do all the real hard work. And the fact that they kind of get the short end every time to me is scandalous. And I wish that there was a way that we could turn the tide on that. But You know, I mean, not until the unions themselves are willing to say, screw it, let's all be out of work and really stick it to them. Because really, what will the AMPTP companies do when they cannot have camera people and art department people? Like if the Directors Guild went on strike, you could find enough enough non-union directors and probably even you might be able to find good non-union ADs. It'd be harder. You can find a ton of really good non-union directors. But could you find that, like, if you had to staff every TV series, could you find enough non-union camera people and art department people and editors and and all that stuff? Could I, It's just impossible. You couldn't do it. It'd be tough. Really I, tough. I mean, I sort of feel like they don't even realize how much power they have in the situation and then they let it go. Probably because it's, you know, we're coming out of a pandemic and everyone's out of money and, and everyone was out of work for a while and the economy, you know, like people want to work. I get it. But to a degree, you have, you have to realize that it's better for all, all the other people doing what you're doing. That's my opinion anyway. So, yeah, it's going to take a bit for uh, the different locals to decide what it is that they want to do and what's really important to them. 
Uh, I just looked up uh, 706. 706 is actually the makeup artist and hairstylist guild. They're the one local that really voted overwhelmingly to approve, as did also the uh, set painters and sign writers. Those two were both big yeses, but uh, most of the others were either. I mean, you know, it's close. their prerogative, too. I'm, I'm like, I'm not saying that they no. shouldn't vote. They should vote however they want to vote. Yeah, they, they should. Uh, 100%. That's the whole point. That's what's great about this country. But, but those were big, big yeses, which was which is interesting just because they're, they're the only two. All the rest were like either really close or they were no. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway. on that sunny note, I mean, you know, honestly, good for them. And part of me is happy that people are going to keep on working. For sure. But I think we should go ahead and get into the interview with Mihai Malimari. Let's do it. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Mihai Malamari, thank you so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast for the second time. Thanks for having me. Hey, you've got a new movie that has just broken on Netflix. I think broke is the way they they say it these days, called The Harder They Fall. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this Western? Well, it's a very unusual one, but on the same time, uh, it is a Western. So like every project, we always try to, to make something new or something that wasn't been done before but in the same time we always like to to look back and especially for for this genre there are so many great examples that uh, we had to find the the perfect combination and i think we we succeeded i think so too you're right it is it is a bit unusual but it is steeped and very much in solidly in the the western genre i mean uh, it's got you know train robberies and shootouts and and all the all the kind of stuff that you would imagine you know quick draw uh, how did you come to the project what made you decide to go down this path I, I read the script and it was very very interesting and then i had a, a an amazing meeting with with james um and like from the first five minutes i uh, i realized like okay if we'll end up working together we'll definitely get along and it will be fun and uh, will be it will be an amazing experience then uh unfortunately covid happened and then everything stopped for everybody thought it would be only two weeks i i thought it would be like three or four and then after after a few months of being home uh, I was like trying to to figure out where things will, will actually go and I remember it was pretty early on I think it was July when James called me and was like tell me you're you're not doing anything if you're if you're ready let's go we're we're going and I'm like what are you talking about <laughs> and sure enough after a week I was um, driving to to New Mexico uh, well, that's great. And uh, and you also mentioned James, uh, James Samuel, who's the director. He's a first time director, at least as far as a, a feature goes. I know he made a very, very long short that is it almost feels sort of related to The Harder They Fall. It's called They Die by Dawn. And I know it was shot by uh, Rodney Charters, you know, another another friend of the show. Can you tell me was, uh, you know, I, I, it's not the same movie, although there are some of the same characters, character names. And uh, was there any reference going back to They Die by Dawn or is it? Was it basically like, you know, uh, throw that out the window, we're starting fresh? What was it, what was it like working with a first-time director who basically kind of made a Western, not exactly the same Western, but a similar sort of Western, eight years ago? <laughs> what, what, what was that like? It, it was very funny because I was I was talking to James. He's like, I, I told him, like, I never never shot a Western. So in theory, like he, he has way more, he had more, way more experience than I did from that perspective. It's interesting because a lot of times when you hear like first time director, you're, you're right away assuming it's like, oh, less experience. I was like, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Maybe um, it can be related to certain procedures on set, but it's one of those that it's what I found it very interesting. Uh, I, I think the director has so many tools and one of the most powerful tools is editing and editing is, is all rhythm. Now, James being such a brilliant musician, like rhythm is part of his breathing, <laughs> you know, so I realized that very early on and, and it was so delightful to talk and uh, do storyboards and plan with him because it's it's amazing how much he knows about rhythm and how, how easy it is for him to, to figure out everything because it's like if, you, if you're aware of the rhythm of a shot or of the rhythm of the scene, it's like that's, that's all you, you need to be able to communicate and make decisions that are like really important to the movie making process. 
I never, and also it's like, it's one of those, like when you agree to be part of the project, that's one thing that you should forget instantly. If somebody is a first time director, it's like, no, we are a team now and we'll figure out how to make these. Yeah, I definitely get the feeling that uh, you, you have to have uh, close collaboration with the director. It's just it's <laughs> it, it's it's so much more helpful to have a have a good experience, and a good project and everyone's on the same page. And it felt to me like watching this that you would have to be you would have to be because there's uh, so much going on with the camera. There's so much uh, dynamic movements and and interesting angles and stuff. It's like, uh, can you talk about the process of the visualization of the movie? And I, I know you're a team and I know he's a, a first time director, but talk about that process uh, of getting the the language down and getting uh, getting getting your shots planned out uh, I mean he had so many things in his mind from the beginning and it was it was also there were like some of them were shots some of them were certain scenes some of them were set pieces that like he kind of uh, he kind of told everybody like the art department and the costume designer and um, and myself and like there, there were certain things he really wanted to do and um, but again it all comes down to prep and when you have enough time to see the locations and it's like you will need to adapt and and kind of keep that idea maybe but finding a different way to to do it and also have enough time to rehearse because there are a lot of things that were like very very technical like uh, from from a stunt perspective or from where everybody is at a certain at a certain moment so uh, it, one of the things like what was interesting and it's always interesting to to be a good listener and to try to figure out what what the directors wanna wanna say and one thing that that struck me and i realized he's absolutely right uh, he told me it's like you know it's like so interesting like in there are so many westerns we all love but in none of them you don't get the feeling like how how dangerous it is to 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 ride to be on a horse and that made me think of so many things and it's like trying to figure out how to place the camera as close as possible to them riding horses like either towards a train or for that um, crimson hood gang um, at the beginning of the movie and there are sometimes just uh, simple ideas that that turned into something quite amazing in in the end. Um, but it is a, it is a team effort. It, it is teamwork all the way through. Yeah, um, you you bring up rehearsals. Uh, I have to imagine that the rehearsals, because you know the fight scenes and the the shootout scenes and the choreography that that's that's involved in it. What would a, re- a typical rehearsal look like for one of these uh, more major scenes look like? There's a, there's a lot of conversation right now going on, of course, about uh, rehearsals and guns and everything else. But can you talk a little bit about how much time is put into is put into all that? Uh, a lot. I mean, the stunts were were doing rehearsals for themselves, and then they, then we'll we'll do. We we had to do so many rehearsals with with a with the horse wranglers. They're so important because you learn so many things and you you get so many interesting ideas, new ideas from just rehearsing with with everybody. Um, and it's also you know it's like on on paper it's like the same thing with with a storyboard. It it can be a great start, but then you realize that some things don't quite match in the real location or and and you need to be open and to adapt but if you have the plan it's so much easier to to do that yeah um james samuel switching gears here just for a second it's also a famous musician uh, has worked a lot with uh, with jay-z i know jay-z came on as a uh, a producer on on this project and he goes by the name of the bullet so and he has a really i want to say amazing soundtrack and you don't usually see director slash music by like this is not usually uh like you know the two hats that the, that the director wears I, I, it does happen of course john carpenter famously and some other people but uh, james samuel here uh, diving into the music he has an eclectic and fun soundtrack of, of, of original music that goes through this whole thing. And I'm curious, was music very much present during the, the production of this? There's a lot of conversation about whether or not music is appropriate on set. And I know a lot of people who are very much purists who say, no, never music. We, we have to get work done and everything else. But because music is so ingrained in this production, did music play a role during the, the production at all? A lot. I mean, the script had so many music notes, which was great. And then uh, I realized after starting prep that music is such a big part of the process for for James. Like think think about it this way: like I'm I'm like the same way steels or or paintings or like 
images are for me and like a lot of times I'm trying to explain something to a director and then like I realize it's so much easier and to just show them an image and and then talk about it the same way is James is like we'll talk about a scene and then he'll say like, oh, hang on a second and he'll bring his guitar or he'll play some music and you're just like watching dailies and just like listening to certain certain music tracks for 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 that scene and it's like it's a tricky one to to do it on set but when you can and without interfering with with safety and and work it's quite amazing because it will it will tell everybody kind of what that scene is about. And it's like the same. I, I think music and, and images, they have such an amazing quality of communicating emotions right away, you know, without like, I think it's harder with words and because they can be interpreted. And like, of course, images and music can be interpreted in different ways. But for some reason, it, it feels that it's a much straightforward communication than than language. Yeah. You definitely get the experience watching this. That music is really, uh, it, it's steeped in music and, and all different genres or many, several different genres of music. And they really do a wonderful job of sort of getting immediately uh, a theme or sort of a feeling. When, when you're on set and James is like, hey, you know, this is like the, the music that I'm, uh, I'm imagining that's going through something, something like this. Uh, are you guys putting on headphones? Are you sharing earbuds? Uh, is, it, is it actually just like it's playing out loud? What's the mechanics uh, of sharing this sort of thing? We, I mean, we always had a big speaker on set, <laughs> but <laughs> no, but it's, it's one of those that like being out of town, we were meeting every day, like every, it, it, definitely in prep, like in prep, there was like, there, there wasn't any weekend. We, we always met at, uh, at James's place and, and listen to music and talk about things. And that's quite amazing because it's like you, you kind of. Again, it, it boils down to, to starting by being a good listener. And it's like you get so much information and then you can start building stuff together. So we kind of knew. And of course, certain things changed. Like the, 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 the soundtrack changed quite dramatically for, for certain scenes. But I think, I think the rhythm was there, you know. And again, it's like that's, that's all you need pretty much. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You guys are, are really timely with this, too, because I definitely feel like Western as a genre is really having a resurgence. And, and, and I mean, recently, but yeah, 2021 in particular, Old Henry just came out, and which is another great, great Western. Uh, I try never to give away spoilers, but at the very, very end of this, there's sort of an allusion to a possible sequel. Have you guys been talking about a sequel? Can you even talk about talk about that at all? There's there's, you know, this there's, 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 N not not so much no. not yeah. not so much but I, I remember talking about that shot and if i remember correctly we actually shot it both ways oh um, okay and it's an interesting moment because it can mean a sequel a sequel but might as well it can just be a, a little twist in in the end and that's that's all i kind of enjoy those those things where like you kind of let the audience fantasize about it yeah i i think so too and i'm not gonna give away the twist which which I, I am proud that I guessed a, a little bit <laughs> okay. early, early before the end of the movie. But I, I feel like it also kind of sets it up for a prequel. I almost kind of feel like you could actually have a, like what happened before, because there's a lot of interesting stuff I'm sure that went on in Nat Love's life before you get to the end of that, before you get to that movie. So, well, let me ask you, what's next for you? Are you, um, if it's not a sequel for this, do you have something else lined up? Are you, uh, are you uh, moving into uh into the world of westerns or, or what, what's going on no i mean i i enjoy doing different things every every time that that being said i like now that i did a western once like i will definitely do one again it's it's very interesting but i i, I just finished a, a, a long project i i didn't do a lot of tv i did a few pilots but uh, this year, I, I I did an amazing project, an amazing TV project um, about the Lakers in the eighties, and it was such an amazing experience. Um, Todd ben, ben Hazel shot the pilot and then called me early on uh, this year, asking me if I want to join him in this uh, this crazy adventure. Mm. And uh, <laughs> um, that, that's unusual going, these days. Yeah. Going from Western to basketball, that it cannot be more <laughs> <laughs> different. Um, it, it was great. It was great. So this was kind of the whole the whole year. And now hopefully I'm taking some time off and uh, we'll see what's next uh, next year. Nice. Uh, a lot of interviews for, for that. I'm, I'm assuming with the 80s <laughs> Lakers, you know, uh, you know, uh, Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all the all the greats. 
yeah, it will it will be a very very interesting one for sure. Oh, okay. Well, uh, phenomenal. That's pretty much all the time that we've got here. And I know that our listeners can find your work easily on Netflix and all kinds of other uh, platforms like that. But do you do anything social? Are you a social media person? Can they can they find you uh, any of uh, Instagrams or things? Yeah, it's it's I, I do. And it's like what's what's strange that I'm I'm kind of trying to to divide because again I'm I'm like shooting so many steals. So I actually have two accounts: one for steals and one for behind the scenes in the movie world and and stills for me are, are a little bit of a therapy because I mean, it's like i'm always carrying a lot of cameras like i think i traveled to new mexico with 14 cameras oh my uh, gosh <laughs> and, are you uh, including the, the production cameras or or, or your personally these are the, uh, your personal cameras or your my personal steel cameras i mean two of them i i use them extensively for tax cuts but because I drove to New Mexico, I could bring my mini lab so I can process C41 in the little bathroom of the rental apartment, wow. <laughs> which was great because we had to quarantine wow. for two weeks. So, yeah, so that's uh, and it's kind of unrelated, but like that's that's a very interesting way for me to show um, a director how a 1940, 1950 lens looks or or how a, a modern 1990s lens Looks. you know it's like it's one of those it's it's playing around or or just um, just walking down the street and keeping the creative juices going <laughs> i'm guessing but uh it's, it's an interesting process i i enjoy it and it's like uh, a lot of times i just, just trying to stay away from people and photographing just empty spaces because after you're you're on a movie set for so long it's like okay now i want to do something that's kind of similar but totally different so i'll just photograph empty streets and buildings <laughs> Uh, all right. I just want to make sure that I understand those. So you you got fourteen cameras. This is just so interesting to me. Are they all different formats too? Or are they? Uh, yeah, you're bringing I mean, a lot of different lenses. What 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 does this look like? It gets worse than that. I I have thirty. <laughs> I have 36 cameras, actually. I think 36. I mean, it happened. Uh, what, what it happened basically, most of the film cameras, uh, they got cheap overnight 10 years mm. ago. And I couldn't resist. And like Craigslist and eBay kind of ruined the whole thing. And, and all of a sudden, it's like amazing cameras that I could never afford were like so affordable. I was like, it will be a pity not to buy it. Now they, they kind of went back up and it's all about different formats and and different lenses i mean that's i i enjoy shooting digital it's nothing wrong about it the, the biggest problem i have with digital is that they are very similar and they most most of them produce a very similar look and now it becomes even more interesting because you can adapt older glass but something like a hasselblad x-pen or or a contact 645 those are like that area of the negative uh, and working in combo with a certain lens it's a totally different look and the fact that the most of the digital sensors are the same shape and sizes that's something that i'm uh, that's why i'm so attractive still to, to to film photography I think that's really fascinating. And having worked for a, a sensor manufacturer, I can tell you that uh, a lot of different cameras out there actually using the exact same sensor too. So it's not just they, all the manufacturers put their own color and their own spin on it. But for the most part, shooting with silicone that that came off uh, the exact same fab and just ended up moving to, from one plant to another and then getting a different name put on the outside of the, uh, the package. But hey, uh, give our listeners your Instagram account where they can uh, they can find these pictures if they want to see some of the stuff that you, you've been doing. Uh, I mean the the Photography one is uh, Malaymare Junior underscore photography, and the the on set one is Malaymare Junior underscore cinematography. Awesome, and we'll put links to that on the Cam Noir show notes page. So I think that's really all that that we have time for. Uh, Mihai, thank you so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. All right, so that was uh, Mihai Malamari. Thanks so much for coming on the show again, and it was great for me to get a turn to get some Mihai in my life and to <laughs> to talk for quite a bit about your, your new film, which you can watch right now on Netflix, which you should totally... Can I just go. say, yeah. what a nice guy he is. Really he's nice just, guy. He's so cool. I find him endlessly fascinating, and I think his work is just top-notch. Agreed. And now, short ends. So, Ilya, you know what time it is now? Uh, 10, 18 p.m. Uh, yeah, actually, you're right. Um, it is time for our patent pending short ends segment, wherein we go into our uh, pet obsessions of this week. 
I'll, I'll dive right in since I think last time I had mentioned there was this cryptic nebulous uh, website oh, no. that Sony had put out there saying like, ooh, mm. there's a new announcement. Uh, the Sony Venice 2. So this nice. is so they, they've got a flagship top of the line camera. They call the Venice. It's a digital cinema camera. It's quite Remember, expensive. Remember, I actually had predicted that it, they were going to be dropping a camera called the Mar Vista. So. Yeah, that's right. Which which I think would have been great if they'd, if they'd gone with the Mar Vista. And and actually, you know, I had predicted they they weren't going to go with the Venice because they had made a a big deal about it when they launched the original Venice that you wouldn't have to keep upgrading the camera body. You could just mm. swap in a new sensor, and it was a user changeable thing. It was non trivial that they built this whole front end of the camera that you could remove these bolts and then bolt on a a new sensor. But lo and behold, they didn't do that. They come up with the Venice 2. And and now that I've read all about it, they have some good reason. The external recording mechanism, which they used to like plop on the back, that's gone. It's now internal recording. And they upped the resolution count to 8.6 or something like that, Mm. 8.6K, which is a, a lot. I mean, and, I can finally watch something on my 8K television. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could have. And and here's the thing, too. It's like, I appreciate all of the camera manufacturers playing this resolution game. And there is some benefits to higher resolution, of course, because you can reframe. Uh, you know, it's better for VFX work. There's things about it. But the reality is that once you start going over 4K, definitely when you start going over 6K, it's a law of diminishing returns and the limiting factor is not the resolution of your camera or even your screen, all things being equal, it's your eyes. And so really the difference between a 6K and an 8K or a 20K, it, depending on the size of the, your screen and your viewing distance is probably zero, probably zero difference to to your eyes. But so is, is the entire reason to, to go 8K just about reframing and giving people a future proof file that they can start with? Anywhere except Japan, the answer is yes. That's 100% true. Japan has got this particular affliction where they believe that 8K production, 8K broadcast, that is the future. They're the only country that feels that way. They're also very much into the sort of the uh, 60 frames per second look, though, too, which yeah. looks very much like, yeah, it's it's, yeah. A, it's, a di- it's a different sort of thing. Not than, a fan. No, and there's only a few places on Earth, too, that are really into that. And so I get it. 60 frame, uh, you know, 8K, this is what they want for their future. It's a lot of look, but I don't necessarily think it's a better look. And for the normal sort of distances, and I do mean normal, like on an 8K television set, you want to see the difference between 8K and 4K, you're going to have to be within about three feet. You're going to have to be really close. And that's not the distance that people watch screens. So I was having this conversation, by the way, literally today with our mutual friend, Jeremy Galise. And Jeremy and I have bonded over the years over our love of the Coen Brothers movie Miller's Crossing, which is getting a Criterion re-release with a brand new 2K scan. And I think this is a perfect time for me to ask you as an expert, why didn't they scan it at 4K? Why would Criterion not scan a movie at 4K? There's several reasons why they might not have. I don't think there's any good reasons. I actually think that if you're scanning a negative, an original negative, you do achieve greater benefit with a 4K scan versus a 2K scan. And I think there's been a lot, uh, having worked for a sensor manufacturer and was also part of the the early digital projection tests over at the Pacific Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, you took me to one of those. Yeah, and, and they're really informative and really wonderful because anyone who goes through and does that can really then learn and see the difference between 2K and 4K. So. And, and please... Set me straight here. I've been going around like an idiot for the last 10 years saying that 35 millimeter is roughly 4K. Is that, I mean, I know that it's not one to one, but before we had common 4K cameras, that was sort of the argument for we should go to 4K. That's about the same resolution as 35 millimeter. You're absolutely correct. When film was captured, printed, and projected properly, you were looking at about 4K's worth of resolution. That's, some people say it was 3.5. Some people said it was 4.1, but it's 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 roughly in the, in the, in in the 4K the, range. Yeah, I mean, like, it's not one, again, it's not one to one. Now, if you went to a typical American movie theater, you were probably seeing more like one and a half K or maybe two at best, because a lot of theaters didn't actually project well. A lot of them had the bulb turned down too low to save the lifespan of, of that very expensive projector bulb. There was a lot of things that the quality of the projectors might have been poor anyway. And you know this because there, uh, there was because a thing, I was a projectionist for many years. Exactly. And <laughs> some theaters did a thing called interlock and interlock. Uh, I, yeah, it, it, I hated doing interlock. Interlock was basically getting one print to show on two screens at the same oh. time. And there's a lot more
more gateway. Beats up your print. It's like it's yeah. it's just an excuse to snap your print. I just went and saw uh, King Richard, and I sat in the mm. very front row at the most extreme left uh, seat in the, in the theater. It was less Sorry. than an ideal experience, uh, not to mention that it was one of those curved screens a little bit. Mm. And I could visibly see how the left corner, closest corner to me, was constantly out of focus. And it wasn't that the movie was, it, you know, the, the, the No, that's the film, projector. It was line. the projection. It was, yeah, it was not, uh, it was out of focus. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I was just curious about the Miller's Crossing thing because I don't buy a lot of Blu-ray rays like i did with dvds but i remember when john carpenter's the thing was remastered by shout factory they scanned it at 2k but this is i don't know probably like six or seven years ago before everything before 4k blu-ray was common and i really was wondering like why would you take uh, a coen brothers movie you're not going to remaster it again this is probably the last time this movie ever gets remastered i don't know maybe you know a high quality 2k mastering 2k scan is really really good it Agreed. is. No. It's, it's really it looks good. good. I just, it's like, it can't be that much cheaper than a 4K scan at this point, especially if you're Criterion, you know, like. It, it, it's like, it's half the data. So, I yeah. mean, a quarter of the data, really. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot less. That being said, I will be buying the shit out of that Blu-ray. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, you'll have to come to the theater and watch it with me because it is my favorite movie. So Will do. Definitely so, in my top five. I never even got to even say anything really about the Venice 2. Anyway, the point of the Venice 2 is 8.6K. It's got a bunch of upgrades. If you're curious about this stuff or you've decided you need a Venice 2 in your life, uh, contact me at Hot Red Cameras and we'll help you out. And so, Ben, what is your short end this week? Uh, My short end was inspired by friend of the show, Charles Pappert. Ooh. Yeah, so Charles posted a thing on Facebook a few weeks ago, and I have recently, I up until like a month ago, I was using an ancient laptop for Zoom sessions, and that's pretty much all I was using it for, because it wouldn't run the current OS, couldn't edit on it, like I couldn't do a lot of stuff on it. It was, you know, probably like a 12-year-old Mac laptop, and it had definitely been a workhorse. And Charles posted this thing about how he wanted to up his Zoom game, and so he was using this software called Reincubate Camo Studio. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to use your phone, iPhone or Android. I I have an iPhone and use the camera on that as a webcam. And so we're all doing Zoom Zoom meetings all the time. And that's probably, I think, even as we go out of the pandemic, I think we're probably going to keep to remote meetings because it's just more convenient to not leave. Uh, You're in L.A. You don't want to sit in two hours of traffic for a 20 minute meeting. So what Reincubate Zoom does, you have to have your phone connected to your computer, but it gives you the best looking webcam I've ever seen. Charles went like super crazy with it and got like one of those teleprompter that you use for an iPhone. And so he was using that to project the image of the person he was talking to. So he would always be making eye contact and then using Reincubate Camo Studio on his phone. But I started using it and, you know, and looking around on YouTube to see what people said, there's a bunch of different systems like this. I think this one's pretty good. I'm not going to download five different ones and test them all out. I think it's I think it's really good. The quality looks great. It is able to throw the background out of focus very effectively. And the camera on your phone is designed to make uh, photographs look great. You're able to use that power on a webcam. It just up. it's it's so much better. Whatever. If you're an Android or, or iPhone person, what whatever you are the camera in your phone is way better than the best webcam you're ever going to get. And it's free. There, there's a free version of it. You have to download it on your phone and also download a desktop driver. And then you just tell Zoom to use it. And, you know, right now I'm I'm here using it. It's using the audio from my phone, which is also pretty cool. And there is a paid version of it that gives you more control. You can be more selective with focus. And there's a bunch of bunch of cool stuff you can do with it i haven't decided if i'm gonna buy the paid version yet i'm still just kind of testing out the free version but uh, Ilya, can you attest is the webcam quality look better than it used to look on a 10 year old laptop yeah significantly better but that's not really surprising the sensor tiny tiny sensor in your laptop monitor from 10 years ago versus the sensor that's inside of your relatively newish phone i mean from the last i don't even have a brand new iphone i've got the iphone 11 which is like i don't know like th- two, that's three years pretty old. recent but there's a huge difference in quality from cameras of a decade ago and cameras in the last couple yeah. of years so but i'd even tried like i'd gotten like some newer like logitech type webcams and i just didn't care for the quality honestly well uh the secret is is that uh a lot of those cameras are are not particularly great because the customers are not demanding high quality from them so they are already higher quality than what's built into a lot of laptops and so pretty much uh, they're being sold usually under 200 bucks 
So the quality doesn't have to be particularly high. Unless you are... Well, and with in, this, I didn't have to buy anything. That's like, right. I, again, I could buy the full studio, and I think that that's like 40 bucks a year or 70 bucks forever. Don't know if I'm going to do it, because the free version is pretty cool. And I, th I think also probably for doing edit sessions with clients, it'll be the best thing that most of these clients have ever dealt with. Not to mention, I think it's fairly easy for you to put your phone in the appropriate position, whereas a lot of other people just are lazy like me and they don't bother to lift up their laptop to get at eye level with your with your phone yeah. and a little tripod or whatever it is or attached to I your I literally screen. got like a little snaky clamp thing. I forget what it's called, but it clamps to the desk and I can put my, my phone at any height wherever I want it in Perfect. any orientation. And if you are putting your camera more or less at eye level, you're going to have a pretty decent looking shot. Mine, yep. you're staring at my I'm nostrils because it's, you know, it's on a, a, a desk. Bit. Yeah, it's, that's how it is so i gotta tip my head down otherwise you know <laughs> you're counting nose hairs that's what's going on so all right so, so super nerdy uh a close focus but actually wow, i think it was so you know, nerdy today it, so we talked about nerdy. resolution we talked about viewing distance it's so but, nerdy. you know hey what i'll tell you what though if our listeners can like up their zoom game uh for free as a result of listening to us i feel like we've done our job and, and you know what? If they start sitting a little closer in the movie theater, we've definitely done our job because that's that's where you get. To, you want to see 4K? Go go about as far away from the screen as it is tall. That that's that's the rule of thumb. You want to see 4K? fourth row center in in any movie theater? If you if you said, hey, where do you want to sit? No matter what, I would always go fourth row center. But fourth row doesn't always work. Fourth row, you don't that that could be you know there could be a stage between you and the screen. It, it could it could be also right I know, up but on it's the screen. It's easy to remember. Anyway, yeah, anyway, one screen height is pretty easy. What, however tall the that screen is, is if, if you can imagine that screen falling forward, wherever that lands, boom, that's where you want to be. Nice. All right. So, so Ben, uh, let's thank some people. I think that's it for this show. Uh, yeah, well, let's uh, first start by thanking and congratulating Kay's Alatrachi, who composed every scrap of music that you heard in this. And Kay's is currently in Atlanta being paid to direct a show. It's so not surprising to me. I mean, yeah, yeah. he's going to be running for Congress before you know it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 10 years ago, Kay's kind of started his transition to directing. And I would say, like, he now has a directing gig. He was hired to direct. I'm, I'm so uh, excited for him. You're jealous. You're a little jealous. I'm totally jealous. Well, if I wasn't also <laughs> directing this week for money, I maybe would be more jealous. But, you know, I'm okay. Even more jealous. You, you, you'd, you'd be cradling your head saying, why? What am I doing with my <laughs> what life? What have I done? Uh, I should be composing music now. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. I should be composing music and color correcting and doing uh, groundbreaking Visual CGI. Things. Yeah. So uh, we should also thank Alana Cody, who is kicking all the ass and getting all of the amazing interviews for us, including the one that you just listened to today with Mihai Malamari. And let's thank Ben Katz, who pointed out to me that I called him brilliant. So uh, let's thank brilliant Ben Katz. Brilliant uh, Ben Katz. I'll say yes. he's brilliant. I'll, I'll shout his name from the mountaintops. Ben Katz m makes me not sound like a dumb fuck every week. It's pretty well, amazing. Well, when you said drooling idiot, he added sound effects of like drool, like he's hitting the floor. <laughs> so he, 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 was, he was right there waiting and, and ready for that. So. I think that that's, that's, that's fair. I open myself up for that on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so thank you, Ben, as, as we do every week. All right. So that's going to do it for another episode of the Cinematography Podcast. Yeah. Please tune in next week and we'll have a brand new episode. Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.